So if we start with these uh, very basic principles of magic as they are described by uh, people like Taylor and uh, and Fraser and the law of the laws of associations or the law of contagion, it's very easy to see how some very early scientific principles have a lot more to do with these uh, very basic observation of similarity and and contact than uh, any real scientific meaning as we have today. So, for example, here from Galen, a second century uh, scientist uh, of uh, of our distant past, he is telling us about how life works, at least life works in the scientific way that he could observe. It appears to me that one ought to also know what diseases arise in men from the powers and from what's the structures. Uh, what, what do I mean by this? By powers, I mean intense and strong juices, and by structures, whatever conformations there are in man. So there is a structure uh, inside of us, perhaps uh, what you could say, something that looks like us, and there are also juices, something that touches us. The nature and construction of the parts within the man are of a like nature, the bladder, the head, the uterus, and women. Uh, these parts clearly attract and are always filled with a juice which is foreign to them. Those parts which are hollow and expended are most likely to receive any humidity flowing into them, but cannot attract it in like manner. Those parts which are solid and round could not attract a humidity nor receive it when it flows to them, for it would glide past and find no place to rest on them. But spongy and rare parts, such as the spleen, the lungs, and the breasts, drink up especially the juices around them and become hardened. Now, of course, this is not how this works. This is not how any of this works. But it is how you can imagine that things work. If you see those parts of a human that are more or less spongy, more or less soft, and uh, you don't see them in action, you don't have the modern science of the day that could tell you exactly how those things work when a human is alive, you can only guess how they might have worked when the human was alive at some point or another. And in this context, the best way that you can explain them is through these uh, very basic principles of observation and perhaps a similar perhaps contact and so uh, the lungs work like spongy parts that absorb life juices um, so you know this is kind of a very practical way to see the human body and especially a very simplistic way that allows us to make sense out of how life has been working for us this whole time and of course, this translates into the way that humans behave as a result of that. And uh, from that point on, we have a, descri a description of life as a principle that is uh, more or less codified, codified through our science. You can explain life through these very basic, more or less physical principles, uh, depending on how people are working. And so based on uh, partly their environment, partly what they are, quote unquote, made of, humans are able to be described by this uh, principle of life. So still from Galen, this uh, with regard to the puzzlen, puzzlenimity, I've never said that word, I've only ever read it, uh, pusillanimity and cowardice of the inhabitants, the principal reason the Asiatics are more unwarlike and of gentler disposition than the Europeans is the nature of the seasons which do not undergo any great changes either to heat or cold or the like, for there is neither excitement of the understanding nor any change of the body whereby the temper might be ruffled and they be roused to inconsiderate emotion and passion rather than living as they do always in the same state. It is changes of all kinds which arouse the understanding of mankind and do not allow them to get into a torpid condition. For these reasons, it appears to me, the Asiatic race is feeble and further owing to their laws for monarchy prevails in the greater part of Asia and where men are not their own masters or independent borrowers, but are the slaves of others. So, uh, obviously, you know, this is ancient uh, science. Uh, this is obvious uh, ancestor to the forms of racism that we know today. And it is kind of interesting to see how some of these um, 
um, not really stereotypes because they're not stereotypes, but these uh, these ideas have remained today uh, in terms of uh, of um, people of Asian origin being weak or being uh, and so pusillanimity meaning a lack of courage, uh, timid, if you will, uh, uh, unwarlike as it is described here. So gentler disposition, meek, demure, however you want to describe it, but you know, unassertive. I don't know. Just looking for synonyms here. Uh, so the 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 description of of people of Asian descent being uh, generally weak, as opposed to the strong Europeans, comes from as ancient as these ideas. And as you can see here, according to Galen, this is a function of um, climate, of the fact that uh, the temperature is always the same in Asia. Apparently, uh, I guess uh, compared to Europe, the seasons are not as well defined. But uh, you know, you could say the same thing about Vermont and uh, the same the rest of uh, the United States. Um, the way in which the seasons are defined are the ways in which people are uh, behaving. And as a result of that, again, this like ver this like attracts like and uh, people are behaving in specific ways based on the weather. And therefore, we can classify an entire uh, um, an entire geography of dozens of different cultures and hundreds of different heritages into a unique weakling type of quote unquote race. Now, of course, this is way before conversations of race that we have today. As I mentioned earlier, this is a conversation about life or what people would have called back then the vitalism, the vital principle. Uh, the vital principle being uh, this abstract um, energy, uh, abstract, uh, I don't know, soul, spirit, if you will, because that is the conversation that we're having right now. This uh, thing, this je ne sais quoi that is inside people and that makes them alive. Fast forward a few years. In the late Middle Ages, uh, early uh, uh, 17th century or six, early 1600s, um, William Gilbert publishes this book called uh, The Magnet, uh, Magnetis Corporibus and Magno Magnetitillary, the magnetic bodies, the great magnet of Earth. Um, and uh, the, this, this, it contains a chapter on Lebens Magnetismus, so the magnet of life. Uh, he describes how, uh, according to his uh, study, according to his classifications, humans are directed by this great magnet of Earth, and uh, everything that we do uh, is is uh, directed by this magnet and affecting us by these magnetic uh, forces of some sort. So um, the the way in which, uh, of course, the these early studies, so uh, around the time of of Newton, around the time of um, of Galileo and Copernicus, people started to discover these greater physical principles. Uh, magnetism is one of those principles that um, there is a larger force that is almost invisible to us, and uh, that would um, be a lot more powerful than any one of us could have thought. And perhaps this form of magnetism could also affect us humans. And uh, eventually, Newton, for example, tells us about how this uh, form of magnetism could be uh, actually a function of uh, how the Earth is working. The power of gravity is of a different nature from the power of magnetism, for the magnetic attraction is not as the matter attracted. Some bodies are attracted more by the magnet, others less, most bodies not at all. The power of magnetism in one and the same body may be increased and diminished, and is sometimes Times far stronger for the quantity of matter than the power of gravity, and in receding from the magnet decreases not as the square, but almost as the cube of the distance, as nearly as I could judge from some rude observations. So magnetism being kind of a variable force could affect different bodies in different ways. And of course, people, if they are affected in different ways by their internal uh, magnetism to the Earth's largest magnetism could be also affected in different ways and uh, creating differences in behaviors. And people, of course, as a result of that, would have a variety of uh, life experiences. Now, Newton is uh, is uh, talking about a, another form here of you know, gravity, another force that is 
obviously invisible and obviously something that he sees as affecting things like the moon and the tides and the much larger, again, forces that none of us would have ever thought would have been possible to affect uh, in terms of force. This is just uh, before that was considered to be a an invisible uh, principle, which can now be codified in a scientific way. So thinking that uh, magnetism could be a force or even later, as Newton discovers, principle of electricity, uh, which would um, which would be a driving force in many parts of of our existence. It is very easy to see how these ideas of a magnet or of electric principle could be some form of a spiritual force and could be sometimes affected by magic. And again, the picture that I showed yesterday of this uh, cartoon magician that shoots lightning bolts, you know, this is an electric principle, an electric uh, particle that is represented in the form of uh, a drawing that we could very easily equate to a magic trick. A little bit later, these uh, ideas of magnetism take hold, especially in some specific levels of uh, science. And um, this particular principle here, described by Leger, is one of animal magnetism. It turns out that uh, we don't have metal, and therefore we cannot be really um, affected by the greater magnets of Earth, but we could still have something within us that helps us move or a form of power. And uh, Leger here talks about this uh, new science uh, that he's trying to pioneer called psychodynamic. Uh, the word psychodynamic, which I have adopted instead of animal magnetism, is derived from Greek, psyche, the soul, and dynamic, power. It means, accordingly, the power of the soul or of the intelligent life of intelligent principle of life. I have also substituted the verb to dunamize in lieu of to magnetize or to mesmerize. Dunamizer for magnetizer, etc., etc., dropping the first radical, psycho, by way of abbreviation. This, this is before uh, conversations about psychology and psychiatry, obviously. Uh, this is not uh, supposed to mean that people are psycho, quote-unquote. Um, this is just a, a, a strange accent. My reasons for making these changes are the following. The old denomination of animal magnetism has been found improper and, in my opinion, with good reason by many persons who, convinced of the necessity of substituting another name for it, have proposed successively those of mental or animal electricity, mesmerism, neurology, or etherology. We're going to talk about mesmerism a little bit more in a second, but animal magnetism is uh, kind of uh, the application of a uh, scientific principle to the ways of life at a time when uh, we are just discovering the sciences of life the way that we are today. Now, mesmerism is uh, the word that is used uh, also sometimes interchangeably with it by the name France Mesmer, who came up with this idea of mesmerism. And of course, if uh, you've ever heard of the word today of somebody being mesmerized, that is a result of that. The same uh, principle remains, though, from what we have seen before. This is an invisible, natural force that people are affected with, and it could have a real physical effect, maybe for healing, maybe for hurting. The work Psychodynami defines as exactly as possible the power that man possesses of materially acting upon man independently of touch. It signifies the influence of mind upon the organization without prejudging or pretending to unravel the secret means of nature to affect the action. Let it be through the agency of a fluid more or less analogous to electricity. Let it be through the undulations of a particular medium. Let it be through sympathy, through the imagination, or even through a combination more or less complicated of those different ways. The name in itself designates only that special faculty of the living man which the commissioners of 1784 have been themselves compelled to acknowledge. So, sympathy, right there, the same law of magic identified by uh, Fraser could be used around the same time to explain how our life is functioning. Uh, summarized here as psychodynamic. Now, this is a uh, quasi-scientific uh, form, of course. This is not a form of religion. This is not a form of belief in any kind of way. This is a practice that people were trying out, and certainly this is an avenue that uh, provides today a lot of uh, a lot of credence to quote-unquote alternative medicine because there is this uh, belief in, in uh, an invisible life force that is affecting us. 
Now, <clears throat> mesmerism uh, kind of disappeared around uh, the late 18th century, uh, kind of got a revival in the 19th century because of these new discoveries in science. And uh, um, so animal magnetism comes to replace mesmerism, but mesmerism still remains in, in some ways um, for some of the more or less educated elites of, uh, of Europe at the time, because it is seen as a practice that has been forgotten and that per perhaps needs to be reevaluated in the context of these new scientific discoveries. So we are reading here a story from Edmund Wilson, a critic, uh, literary critic, who is telling us what uh, Charles Dickens was doing uh, during his lifetime, or really towards the end of his lifetime. He had the strange experience reported by Miss Mrs. Perugini with an English woman he had met in Genoa, 1844. This lady who was married to a Swiss printer was afflicted with delusions that took the form of a phantom which spoke to her and other illusionary figures of the most hideous shapes and gory appearance which came in a crowd shattering one to the other as they pursued her and after a time faded, veiling their loathsome faces as they disappeared into space. Diggins hypnotized her once or twice every day and found that he could control the delusions. He seems to have become obsessed with the case. The treatment went on for months. On one occasion, he was in such a fever of anxiety to receive a letter from his friend concerning the state of his wife that he watched through a telescope the arrival of the mailbags into port. He mesmerized her in the open country and at wayside inns where they would halt for refreshment or stay the night. He mesmerized her in railway carriages anywhere if the moment was opportune. By degrees, she became better and more serene in her mind and body. Delusions were apparently dispelled. So Dickens, Charles Dickens, the writer, uh, learned this technique of mesmerizing and experimented on uh, this uh, lady. Also, apparently, experimented on his family uh, and tested it uh, in England, in Italy, in many places uh, where he could. And of course, in this case, he provided some relief to this woman who was seeing spirits, ghosts, perhaps. Um, so whether uh, this this form of mesmerism is a real science or is it a psychosomatic uh, function, you know, is not particularly clear. And however real these stories are is not important to us, as you probably know. But it is kind of turning into this uh, practice that could provide relief where traditional science is not able to do so. Eventually, the same thing turns into, the same principle turns into much more organized societies, such as Harmonia Universalis, uh, founded in Paris. This uh, cartoon here represents the Medsum Magnetiseur, the magnetizing doctor, uh, helping a, a poor lady solve her issues. And of course, this is a very um, expressive caricature here of uh, the person uh, helping uh, a poor lady that is uh, needing help, um, you know, read into this whatever you want, but uh, there are principles of uh, trying to affect the laws of nature with some kind of uh, mystical practice is uh, certainly nothing new.